Let us pray. O God, on this glorious resurrection morning, we pray that the truth of Christ will dawn in each of our hearts and that you will remove the stones of unbelief through your word today. We pray in, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Pilate said, go and make the tomb as secure as you can. Those were his words to the Jewish religious authorities of Jesus' day after the crucifixion. Now, it seems to me that on that first Easter, a lot of people were obsessed with issues of security. We're not a lot different today, are we? We all worry about security. We have alarms everywhere. We have home alarms, car alarms, fire alarms. We've got video surveillance all over the place. We have all kinds of security measures. And we even now have security on our highways and on our roads. Most of them, anyway. I remember when our youngest child was still at home. This is going back over 10 years ago. He borrowed the family car one day, and he must have gone through an intersection a little too slowly. Then again, maybe it was a little too fast. And the light turned red. Two weeks later, there's an envelope in the mail. It's a ticket, a big ticket for running a red light. But you know who it's addressed to? The owner of the car. Go figure. My kid runs a red light and dad ends up getting the ticket. That is sometimes how it goes. Well, I remember, you know, security isn't always 100%, is it? I remember when we lived in Mississauga for many years, we had this delightful older couple that lived across the street from us. He was a retired engineering prof from U of T. And he had this little sports car that was his pride and joy. And I remember one summer we had a rash of break-ins in cars in our neighborhood. And our own car was broken into and a GPS was stolen. But this man's sports car was broken into not once, but three times. And he even had the car alarm on. He, it was at the point where he was about to put a, a sign in the window of the car saying there's nothing of value in this car. Like I say, sometimes security things are not 100% fail-safe. I'm reminded of the story of a woman who died and left explicit instructions in her will about her gravesite. She was not a believer in the resurrection or an afterlife, and she gave uh, orders in that will that her grave would have this huge granite slab put over top of it, and the tombstone would be, have these large iron clasps holding it down. And even on her gravestone, she wanted these words put on it, this grave shall never be opened. I guess she felt that if there was a resurrection, she wanted to make sure it didn't find her. Well, you know what happened. Over the years, a tiny seed got underneath that granite slab. A little plant formed. It developed a, a small crack in the slab, and then a larger fissure, and eventually the grave burst open. Amazing, really, what human hands could not do, the force of nature was able to accomplish. Well, I think that dynamic seed is a, an example of a universal force in our world. It's really a sign of the tremendous power of God. And that's the thing about Easter. When it comes to resurrection, resurrection isn't a big deal for a God who created everything out of nothing. We know that Jesus rose from the grave on this day. It's wonderful. But still, there were a lot of people obsessed with security issues in Jesus' day. We know that the religious authorities were. They were jealous of Jesus and his power and authority. They wanted to do away with him. 
And they said it's better that one man should die for the people than the entire nation perish. And so they send soldiers to secure Jesus in the garden, armed soldiers. Peter takes up his sword, tries to defend Jesus. All of the disciples run away, worried about their own security. At Jesus' trial, there was a lot of concern about security. Pilate was worried about a riot. Easter. Easter is really about our ultimate security in Christ, isn't it? About our eternal salvation. Now, there are many countries in our world that have a ceremony called the changing of the guard. In some countries, it's a big tourist attraction, like in London, England. If you've ever been to Buckingham Palace, they have a very impressive changing of the guard. Or at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, they've got something called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and it's, it's guarded by a soldier around the clock, and there's a, again an elaborate changing of the guard, sort of a sign of security for the American nation. Well, back in Jesus' day, after the crucifixion, Pilate orders the tomb to be guarded by soldiers, but not just any soldiers. These are highly trained Roman centurions. They would make sure that no one entered or left that tomb without them knowing it. And I'm guessing that the Jewish religious authorities, the ones who voted to put Jesus to death, I'm guessing that they slept pretty soundly for the first two nights after the crucifixion, knowing that Jesus was in that tomb, that he was secured there, and that there were soldiers guarding the entrance. But then, of course, we know what happened on that first Easter morning. The women go early to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, only to discover the stone has been rolled away by an earthquake. The guards have fallen down as if they are dead. An angel tells them that Jesus has risen, and they run away from the tomb in both joy and terror, only to run into Jesus. And there's really a delicious irony here. The women run away from the security of the tomb only to run into the resurrection of Jesus himself. Well, today's gospel lesson is about seeing Easter from a different kind of perspective. It begins with a secure tomb, but it ends with a Jesus who is far from safe and secure. In fact, he has risen, and the tomb could not contain him. On this Easter Sunday, I want to reflect about some of the truths found in Jesus' resurrection, and in particular, in the tomb. Now, when you read through the Gospels, you discover that you cannot secure Jesus. Jesus refuses to be contained in either a tomb or in our narrow-mindedness. Verse 62, the next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that what this imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it as secure as you can. Now, down through the centuries, people have tried to secure the tomb of Jesus. In other words, to disprove the resurrection and deny the divinity of Christ. We know the Pharisees and the Romans tried to keep Jesus in the tomb, but no crucifixion or no guard could do that. The apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, tried to persecute the church. Then he met Jesus on the Damascus road and became the great missionary to the Gentiles. Many of the emperors tried to stamp out Christianity, but the church grew. People, even today, 
try to secure their own lives. Even Christians try to keep Jesus in a secure place. Sometimes we don't pray enough. We don't serve enough. We don't read our Bible enough. We try to be as self-reliant as we possibly can. And we try to keep Jesus secure and away from us. But he breaks through. And the dawn at Easter, the old guard is removed. The old ways of greed and sin and death fall to the ground. It's as one theologian put it, the angel rolled away the stone not to open the grave for Jesus, but to show the empty grave to the world. In one sense, Easter is a glorious changing of the guard. Sin and evil tried to do their best to secure Jesus, but they could not. A new day had dawned. Easter tells us that you cannot secure Jesus in the tomb. Next, Easter is God's message that Jesus has conquered death. He's conquered the grave and its fear. Matthew 28, verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. But he is not here, for he has been raised, as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead and is indeed going ahead of you. The writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, spent a good deal of his life struggling with illness. And on one occasion, a very pompous missionary came to visit him and wanted to talk to him as a man who was in danger of dying. And with his typical wit, Stevenson wanted to talk about himself as being a man in danger of living. And so he said to the missionary, I am a very sick man, but I suppose I can get better. Any fool can die. As a matter of fact, all of us do. I'm going to need much more help if I want to go on living. Resurrection is not about death, but about the possibility of living. Living life as God intended it. I've always loved the writings of the American pastor, the late Frederick Beekner. He had this to say about Easter. We can say that the story of the resurrection means simply that the teachings of Jesus are immortal, like the plays of Shakespeare or the music of Beethoven, or that their wisdom and truth will live on forever. Or we can say that the resurrection means that the spirit of Jesus is undying, that he himself lives on among us the way Socrates does, for instance, in the good that he left behind him, in the lives of all who follow his great example. Or we could say that the language in which the Gospels describe the resurrection of Jesus is the language of poetry, and that, that as such it is not to be taken literally, but as pointing to a truth more profound than the literal. Yet, says Beekner, in the case of the resurrection, this simply does not apply. Resurrection is not described at all. There is no poetry about it. Instead, it is simply proclaimed as fact. Beekner reminds us that the church did not create the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Rather, the resurrection of Jesus created the church. The resurrection is proclaimed as fact in the New Testament. It affirms this truth that Jesus conquered death. Next, the rest of the New Testament then basically tells us this truth. We can know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. This was the passion of the Apostle Paul when he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may obtain 
the resurrection from the dead. As the first Christians came to recognize the risen Christ, they experienced a boldness and a freedom of speech that surprised everyone. It's as if their security came from the inside out. They were not afraid of scoffers. They were not afraid of the authorities who said to them, stop preaching this Jesus. They were not worried about others. In the resurrection, hope trumps fear. Life conquers death. Love wins. Good cannot be overcome by evil. Resurrection is not just about what happens to Jesus. It's also about, about what happens to us as we try to follow him. You see, there are no guarantees, no promises that all will be well, that our families and our churches will do well. There's no promises that our finances will be fine, our physical health will be good, or that our hearts will beat forever. But the promise is that one, the one who gave life, will never leave us. Nothing in your past, your present, or your future can define you. You are defined by God's love and the life of Christ working within you. You don't prove this love, you embrace it. You don't prove this power, you experience it. You don't prove this life, you live it. Easter addresses the universal human longing to find meaning and purpose. St. Augustine described it as a restlessness which finds its rest in God. The philosopher Kierkegaard called it the leap of faith which quells our anxiety. But whatever we call it, we know that God is part of it. The late evangelist Billy Graham once said, A dead Jesus can't save anyone, but a living Christ can save your life and change your life. The writer to the Hebrews put it this way, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus likewise shared the same things, so that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Jesus came to free those who are enslaved by the fear of death. On Good Friday, it looked like evil had won, but on Sunday, Jesus won the only battle that really matters. The security of the tomb, it could not hold Jesus. The resurrection tells us how everything will end. It's like the old saint who said, I've read the end of the Bible, and we win. Our future here on earth may be uncertain. We don't know what the future holds for us as we journey forward. But in the end, we know how it will all turn out. The resurrection of Jesus is but a foretaste of that great hope and promise. So let us go out from here today to proclaim, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. O oh God, on this Easter Sunday, we rejoice in the resurrection of our Lord. We thank you that no tomb or grave could hold Jesus. He has overcome death and granted us all life in him. Forgive our unbelief and our trust in the securities of this life. Show us, O oh God, that true security is found in Christ, for he is our eternal salvation, the one who lived and died to bring us back to you, O oh Lord. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And for this we give thanks today. Amen.